<laughs> you're you're very kind. <laughs> okay. So, Joe, thank you so much for joining me this evening. And I think your morning, um, based in the US. Yep. Um, yes, ma'am. Fantastic. It's it's really an honor and a pleasure to, to have you with me today. I really appreciate it. I came across your profile on LinkedIn and more so some podcasts that you have been doing lately. And I was just absolutely intrigued. You're a certified IT professional, international keynote speaker. You're currently the chief technology officer and you have got an amazing 30 year uh, career or history, I believe. So welcome. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure. I'd love to hear a little bit more about you and the audience to hear your background. Absolutely, Tricia. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm the one who's honored uh, to be on your program and to uh, uh, hopefully to be uh, something that'll be beneficial. So about me. Uh, well, uh, after, um, uh, after getting my bachelor's degree in secondary ed, I started off my professional career as a school teacher for 10 years. I transitioned into the world of IT in the early 90s when I started working at NC State University. Uh, there I was a computer consultant. And over the next 25 years, I started you know, moving up through the ranks, leveraging my communication skills, my teaching skills, instructional design skills uh, to develop some really, really nice training programs um, and uh, speaking at various university events. Uh, leading discussions, um, emceeing events, uh, along with all the other amazing stuff that I was doing with application development, database design, host of other things I enjoyed tremendously. Uh, and during that time, I was promoted to computer training manager, then analyst programmer, and finished up my career there as business intelligence specialist. Now, some really awesome, phenomenal, tremendous people from uh, the Department of Health and Human, Human Services in the state of North Carolina recruited me away from NC State because I, I wasn't really looking for a job. They they were looking for me. Uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, it was a major promotion uh, for me, a great best career move I ever made. Uh, more importantly, it was, it was best for my family because that to me is more important than, than a career anyway. Uh, and so I'm now a senior systems analyst and team lead uh, in the IT division there. I love my job. Uh, besides all the cool techie stuff I get to do, I get to take processes apart. Uh, I liaise between high level business people on one side and high level tech people on the other side. And because I can talk to both types of people, I'm able to, by the grace of God, um, provide some sort of um, resolution to issues uh, bring them together so they can talk, find, uh, tease out functional requirements, business requirements, technical requirements in such a way that hopefully produces solutions that everybody can be happy with because I can talk to both groups of people, you know, give them something that, that um, something that everybody can, uh, can agree to. Uh, and then I'm also spearheading some business intelligence initiatives uh, that uh, will hopefully make our uh, client services data warehouse an even better organization than it is. Now, during all this time, I've not lost my love for communication, my love for teaching, uh, because the doors have opened up to give me a whole host of speaking opportunities that uh, I've, I've just been amazed uh, as to uh, how these things literally seem to have dropped in my lap. Um, but I stay busy. Uh, I love doing this, uh, loving life, loving my job, love my family. And um, let's see. Um, I just try to stay busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really great. There's there's not many people with this much passion and enthusiasm especially in in today's situation. So it's really great to hear. And I would love to ask you and hear your opinion as everyone has worked from home now. What are the most challenging mm -hmm. uh, situations or from a technical standpoint for, now that everyone's at home for, from a company perspective? Right. Um, some of the challenging things are ma maintaining communication with, uh, with your peers. I mean, you know, you, you, you can pick up, you can pick up the phone and call them, which of course I need to put mine on silent so that it doesn't disturb us while we're, while we're talking here. Um, so that's a distraction. Uh, <laughs> uh but, uh, another thing is, you know, you don't have that face-to-face -face communication. You don't have, I mean, you do, if you're using, you know, webcams or whatnot, um, but you don't have that that interpersonal reaction. You don't have the um, uh, uh, 
the the body language you know the the eye contact the inflections in the voice that uh, that you can pick up on when you know you're 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 in person so so there's that uh, there's uh, getting up and walking around with your with your colleagues you know if I I get up and I take a walk you know I, yes working from home sitting in front of a computer screen you're going to turn into a couch potato but you know you have to get up and take walks and stuff but unless you've got your wireless headset with you, you you know, if you're, you can't have one of those meetings, I guess, I suppose, if you have teams on your phone, you put your Bluetooth in, then yeah, you can take a walk while you're, while you're talking to your colleagues. So, you know, you think of certain creative ways to still keep yourself active and, and keep in touch with, with your colleagues, but uh, it takes initiative on the part of both the person who wants to initiate the conversation and you know the person on the other end if they're uh, if they're not busy doing something else so you know i i have to do that that that's a challenge um the uh the challenge of if if there's uh if there's a power outage uh well you're working you know if you're working in a in a, in a building yeah, you can't get to your computer, but if you've got paper files or if you have a, a training session that you're going to go to that doesn't require, you can still do that. But a power failure when you're depending on the internet to be able to, you know, you don't have a backup situation or whatnot, you know, you're up the creek without a paddle. So uh, yeah, there there are some challenges uh, with um, uh, in, in this particular environment. But I think the biggest one though is uh, maintaining the communication and the relationship with uh, uh, with your coworkers. Mm -mm, absolutely, and I think maybe differentiating yourself from your home life and personal life to work. You know, right. So that yeah, the blending of the lines uh, becomes a bit more blurred, you know, because uh, you know there, there's good and bad with that, right? I mean, the good part is, hey, I'm not spending three hundred dollars a month on gas, you know, to drive uh, forty five minutes one way to get to work, or two hours, or thirty. In my case, it's between thirty and forty. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, that's money I'm not spending on gas. That's time that I'm not spending in the commute. It's about an hour, uh, an hour to an hour and a half a day, um, uh, of my day that's gone just in being on the road. Uh, but then again, you know, that's uh time that I would have spent on other phone calls, you know, during that, that transit time. So, you know, you, 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 you are you going to look at the positive or are you going to look at the negative? So that's, that's a positive. I'm not spending the money on gas. Um, I don't have to be concerned that if I leave from work five minutes later, I'll get home 20 minutes later, you know, because <laughs> the later and later you leave, if the traffic starts building. If it's a certain time of day, then, you know, you get home that much later, you delay supper for your family or, or whatnot. Um, so I no longer have that concern that uh, if I do have to work late, it's great because I don't have the commute. Um, you know, the commute is to get up from the kitchen table and walk into my office area and, you know, turn on my computer and I'm at work. Mm. Uh, the, the negative of that, though, as you said, the blending is you do tend to work later because you can and you know that all you have to do is just shut off your computer and walk away and you're done and you're home. But sometimes that tends to um, uh, tends to eat into the supper time when you've got something you got to get done and uh, and supper's fixing to be ready and I have to get up and help my wife, you know, with supper or whatnot. Uh, you, you know, so you, you have to set boundaries still. Um, and one is having a specific area uh, that you designate as the work area that is separate from your home area. Uh, having a designated time that you are going to get up and walk away from the computer, you know, just like you would if you were at work, work, okay, um, and um, and ensuring that um, work doesn't encroach into family. Uh, and I, you know, I don't have a dog. My kids are grown, so it's not like I have family encroaching into work. But um, you know, it's okay family can encroach into work. I don't want work to encroach into family. You know, I, I want to have my priorities in the right place. But at the same time, to have that delineation between the two so that I can uh, concentrate and be focused and do what I need to do so that my boss keeps saying nice stuff about me. <laughs> that's it. That's, that's the main point, isn't it? But I, I think right. as much as we can say say this, and definitely it's, it's a culture that we start, we need to adapt. It's so important. Yes these types of things are coming from top down. I mean, 
you, there's only so much you can say, I'll do this. But then when you get demands coming down to say the deadline is 5 p.m. when it's already past 5 p.m., for example, <laughs> right on the line to say no, you, you know what I mean? I think it's something that, that, that organizations need to encourage from, as a top down approach. Precisely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, you know, uh, and, and fortunately with with my employer, uh, you know, they're they're very understanding and they uh, understand that, you know, there is such a thing as a work life balance um, and there is such a thing as a work slash family balance. And, you know, it, it's part of a uh, uh, part of a mentality in recent years that I that I do uh, a trend that I do like. And that is of people realizing, you know, your employees are going to be more productive if these concerns about issues that are important to them are concerns that they don't have to worry about. You know, if some tragic emergency takes place, you know, uh, do you have a micromanager that has his thumb on you that that's going to be make unreasonable demands? Or do you have somebody who's going to be understanding and give you uh, give you leeway, give you latitude to be able to do what you got to do, knowing that in return, you've got the dedication that you're going to give 120% when you get back, mm. you know, and, and things are still going to get done. Uh, you know, that, that's a level of trust that you build up as an employee by having given your best, by having the integrity to know that even though your boss is not looking at you, you're not sitting there playing solitaire on the side or whatever, you know, that you really are getting your work done and, and it shows in the results uh, and it shows in your attentiveness and your engagement uh, with the mission, vision and goals of your organization. And so the reward for that is understanding on the leadership side when something does happen that pulls you away because you have already built up that trust ahead of time by your dedication, your integrity, your work ethic, uh, and uh, the uh, the honing of your craft, as it were, uh, and uh, the, the commitment to excellence in, in everything that you do, uh, giving it everything you've got because you know that uh, this is the thing, you know, this is your vocation, this is what you're getting paid for, and, you know, you're, when, you're, when you're brought up with a, I don't know, you call it the, the Judeo-Christian ethic or the, you know, whatever you want to call it, of having that work ethic of giving the best of yourself, whether you expect to get anything back or not, employers will tend to appreciate that, and then, you know, you will have learned uh, how to do right, and you not only learned, but you will have also earned, uh, you know, that that level of trust so that uh, you can break away when you have to break away, uh, especially when, you know, the leadership knows that they can count on you to get things done. Absolutely. I think you definitely touched on some great points. And, and I think people need to reflect, even top-line management, that that these days, and even especially for sales roles, that that there's more than just the number. Because now more than ever, right. I'm not going to hit targets compared to what they used to do. And even though productivity has probably increased um, working from home, I think maybe it might not always translate into companies actually hitting the target. But it doesn't mean that productivity is not there. So it's just recognizing exactly. despite not maybe hitting numbers, productivity is there it's it's the situational that the situational changes that have you know incurred these right issues. and I absolutely that, mm. you're not going to hit those numbers you know and, and and that's just it you know you're you're building um you're building a reputation for excellence right i mean i'm, I'm not in sales but if i were uh it, it would be a situation where okay uh i'm building my customer base uh i am providing for the needs of my customers i may not build up more sales over a greater number of customers, but by taking care of the ones that I have and, um, you know, being concerned about producing whatever goods, you know, you're either producing goods or services, right? And the consumer is demanding those goods or services. You produce something that is the, the highest possible quality for the best possible value, right? Uh, you may not hit those numbers now, but the reputation that you build in this interim places you in a much better position later on 
when the situation changes and people are going to remember uh, the high quality that you provided during this time. And, you know, the numbers will come then. It may be later, but, you know, I mean, that's the whole idea behind investment, right? Whether you invest money now to get greater returns later, you invest time now to get greater satisfaction later, or you invest your sweat equity now um, to get better results later from customer satisfaction. And they're remembering and identifying with you as the provider of that good or service that they were demanding. Word gets out and the numbers, the targets will be hit later on when the situation changes and the market starts getting moving and so forth. Maybe summarize this fantastic explanation in two words, customer centricity. Because then, yes. yeah, if you invest the time into the customer, then become centric, then then in time to come, they they come back to you. So, yeah, I think that's really yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's a good uh, it's a good discussion because and me, I, I am uh, in healthcare originally in nursing, but this oh. is my background. Yeah, but but you can apply this centricity to any organization, and and I know that times, and I've got a lot of customers and clients of mine who are in sales. I work with a lot of people in sales for their CVs and LinkedIn because they're the ones out of a job or, or at risk of being losing their job because they're not hitting numbers. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And, and I would love your insights or maybe opinion. I think maybe now that consumer confidence is increasing a little bit with some news of vaccines coming and maybe even one, I think the UK today announced that they would have one mm -hmm. uh, uh, ready. Um, post COVID and maybe the new norm, I guess, what can we do to, to facilitate innovation to be able to make sure that, um, that, that employees uh, remain productive into this new world and maybe automation is going to be occurring more so than ever? That is, hmm, that's an excellent um... <laughs> uh, that, that's that's not bad wow that's uh, uh i i like that no no I, I i like that that's um oh my gosh well you know uh if if people if people recognize that they are a valued part of the organization okay they're not going to view um uh they're not going to view innovation as uh as an enemy okay um, that's a problem when people when people see change as a threat, uh, then they're going to be stuck in mediocrity. Okay, uh, mediocrity breeds stagnation, in my opinion. All right, and uh, they don't need to be stuck there. They need to see change as an opportunity rather than a threat, uh, an opportunity for them to grow, an opportunity for them to adapt. Okay, um, because you know if, if they don't adapt, then they're going to be left. And they're going to be left behind. Um, you know the 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 stress that uh, that we've had as as a result of the massive changes in our society because of COVID nineteen. Uh, you know, it, it produces a lot of stress. Um, you know, I mean, research tells us that uh, acute stress is a good thing. You know, our brains and our bodies wake up for action. Right? It enhances our performance. Uh, in time of danger, it's that whole fight or flight thing that that we've we've heard. You know, uh, that's acute stress. But chronic stress, not so much. You know, because we, you know, we evoke the stress response more easily. Uh, it, it's triggered more often and more easily uh, in response to lower and lower levels of stress because you know it's it's constantly you know we're constantly bombarded with it. You know, and then. It takes longer and longer for us to revert to the normal stress, uh, the normal state, right? So, um, you know, there, that can lead to a whole bunch of uh, mental and physical illness. So, people need to, you know, uh, understand how to how to deal with that. Um, I mean, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, uh, change is a thing that's that's here to stay. You know, um, uh, I in one of my uh, presentations, I quoted George Bernard Shaw. The Irish author, he says, "Progress, uh, progress, and progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, change is here to stay. And uh, I mean, you know, coronavirus has uh, permanently altered uh, many of of the elements. You know, uh, I think there was a guy named 
uh, William Arruda. Uh, uh, he says it's, um, uh, it's global, enduring, pervasively disruptive, and impossible to ignore. Uh, and, and it is. So, um, you know, the more quickly that we learn to adapt, then uh, the more quickly we can, uh, uh, we can move forward and, and deal with it and emerge uh, on, on the other side. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And maybe this is going off a little off, off topic, but you mentioned that, you know, mental health and it's, it's becoming a toll on us with pandemic. But I think maybe now more than ever, organizations have a responsibility to nurture, foster and, and yeah, look after the employees from this perspective, because, you know, three, two, one, one year ago, that wouldn't have even crossed their minds. Now, who is it? I mean, not many organizations have a health and well-being sector, for example. I mean, does it fall to HR? Does it fall to direct line managers? I think, you know, people, a lot of people are feeling maybe isolated, overwhelmed, overburdened. Um, and I think that it's it's something that organizations and companies really need to consider. I don't know, it's a bit off topic. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. No, no, that that's that that's that's quite all right. Uh you know, uh I I, I think it's important. Um I, I couldn't agree with you more, you know. Um for for management in general, from the top down, I, I think one of the most important things is to to value their employees. You know, to see their employees as an asset to be invested in, rather than a cost to be justified. I mean, you know, we can talk about increasing pay, we can talk about getting better benefits, we can talk about improving the physical conditions of their work, physical, you know, workplace, um, a host of other things. But but at the end of the day. Um, you got to consider the human factor, right? Look, people, I, I believe people tend to enjoy their jobs more when they feel valued, okay? And, and nothing says you are important to the situation, right? You are important to this organization. Nothing says that more than a manager who's going to listen to you, who's going to pay attention to the needs, your opinions, your ideas, your goals, okay? Um, uh, the, the other thing is empowerment. Right, it, it, people need to know that they have the ability the, to do their job. You know, the means to do their job and the ability and the authority. You know, whatever. Um, you know, uh, uh, one thing is 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 educating the employees, uh, providing opportunities to be trained. Um, I think it was Henry Ford who said uh, the only thing worse than training your employees and having them leave is not training your employees and having them stay, right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, the, the health and well-being of, of employees is good. Uh, they, you know, they, they feel, if they feel valued, I mean, it, it's amazing what uh, the, the lengths to, to, to which an employee will go if they feel valued. You know, they, they know that you trust them. They know that you are important to the success of the organization. Then, uh, I don't know, like me, I if I, I tend to give more, you know, I tend to be more productive and knowing that what I make makes a difference and who I am is appreciated by this organization. And uh, then I'm going to do, you know, what I can to help benefit the organization. Mm, absolutely. And I think maybe this is only an opinion, no evidence for this, but uh -huh. People maybe are working more in 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 uh, reflection or fear that they may be cut because as as right. budget cuts are going now, you know, top line millions of dollars worth of salaries, even high performers are going at the at the cost of the company not folding. So maybe workers are are now feeling more pressured, but also giving more or doing more. Um, to, in fear that they'll lose their job. But maybe this is is something over a long term that's that's actually not not wise to be doing because then expectations will remain the same for that employee to deliver the same deliverables under less stress. Yeah, that's that's a good point as well, you know, and, and this is where understanding, you know, uh, I don't know, a level of under uh, a higher level of understanding between employee and management, uh, uh, more communication between the two and knowing, OK, what are the expectations, right? Um, what are uh, what are the goals for me to succeed? You know how uh, what can we do as an organization to help you as an employee succeed? Um, what can the employee do to help the organization succeed, regardless of the surrounding circumstances? Because yeah, you're right. Once the pressure is gone, 
then you know uh, will the uh, will the same level of dedication and performance be there? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, not everybody is self motivated. You know, for, for sure, absolutely, definitely. It's, right. Yeah, and I would love your uh, your your headline on your LinkedIn says "Bringing Data to Life and Life to Data." Can you walk us through yeah. that? Sure. So bringing life to data and bringing data to life. Um, bringing life to data is like, you know, you, you think of data as being just a set of numbers, um, rows and columns on a spreadsheet, uh, a pie chart, a bar graph, uh, a, a line chart, a, a heat map or, or whatever. And bringing life to it essentially allows it to do what it needs to do. And by that, I mean, use it in a way that helps decision makers derive the insight that they need to make the decisions that they need to make on a daily basis. Okay, I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for actionable data, uh, that it's not just something that sits there. It's not something that's neutral. It's something that needs to be capitalized upon. It's something that uh, that leadership needs to look at and say, okay, what insight can I draw from this? Okay, that's that's bringing life to data. Bringing data to life is from the data perspective is preparing it and presenting it in a way that showcases uh, the insights that these decision makers can can draw from it. Uh, and, and the life on both ends is being passionate about it uh, in, in a way that um, uh, uh, that you approach it with excellence and you approach it uh, uh, with with a desire to um, enhance the bottom line or to uh, you know do what needs to be done to serve uh, the people that you're called to serve. You know you you serve them better when you understand what it is that they want, right? Uh, again, we go back to this goods and services bit, right? Uh, you know, you have a service that you provide. Uh, well, how do you know that that service is serving, <laughs> you know, is, is providing something that, that people need? Well, you get that from by feedback, um, uh, feedback from the customer, uh, the amount of sales, uh, the, um, you know, number of sales in a, in a given time period. You know, uh, uh, did you have some sort of promotion going? You're, you're not going to know the answers to those questions unless you have data, right? I mean, you might know, you know, you, in your head, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I sold more last week than I did the week before because of X, Y, Z, because you got it up in your head. Well, there's going to come a time and po a point in time where <laughs> you're not going to be able to remember, you know, have it all up in your head, write it down, you know, gather the data, and then derive the insights from uh, those data that you've been collecting to be able to make the decisions to drive your business even further by making right decisions based on uh, the uh, the data that you have. So all this uh, is making it more three-dimensional rather than just some flat thing that just sits on a piece of paper or on a computer screen. Absolutely. So uh, it needs to be brought to life. I think that this is a skill that's difficult to teach, that there's so much data these days. I mean, now with technology, you can get so much analytics about nearly, you know, anything, anything you want, you can have data for, but being able to translate the, the findings into practice with actionable outcomes, and whether that's something simple as sales figures to business to be able to segment your market, all the way through to mm -hmm. analyzing stocks or analyzing property, for example, the, the spectrum so huge, but being, being able to teach other people how to pull data and filter it into meaningful actions is so difficult. I, I don't know, do, have you found it? Yeah. Something oh, absolutely. Yeah. See, uh, there's there's a much greater emphasis being placed on on data. Okay. Um, I tell you what I mean. Um, there was a recent report in a uh, in a CIO magazine. Uh, it, healthcare alone, healthcare data volumes are nearly doubling every two years. Now, with such huge mountains of data. <laughs> I mean, there's no way that the prior uh, the prior generation reporting means the the, the typical ones use, you know, like uh, spreadsheets, tabular reports, and, and that sort of thing can keep can keep up. Now, again, uh, a paradigm shift is needed. Uh, see, before the focus used to be on data production, whereas now it's on data consumption and putting it into context so that it can be made actionable. 
Now, again, it's uh, as I say in, in one of my popular presentations that I that I keep, you know, people people. Oh, yeah, I know what he's going to say. You know, data is not actionable unless it can help key strategists to make a decision, answer a question or solve a problem. And if it can't do one of those three things, then it's it's useless. OK, so if if decision makers have any inkling of the elephant in the room, you know, the data, right? then they can be convinced of the need to capitalize on what they've got. Uh, and that's gonna result in a unified, comprehensive strategy for tapping into it mm -hmm. and reporting on it in a visually compelling manner. Mm -hmm. That's the key. See, that's where the biggest payoff comes. You know, when you've made a connection with the decision makers, you know, that's when the light bulb comes on. That's where the magic happens, as it were. Um, and, you know, th th they need to see that. Right. So capitalizing on it um, and um, connecting with uh, uh, connecting with their audience. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Do you think that these types of roles will be more um, valued or important or open up in, in, in the future? Oh, I think so. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. And, and, and now's the time to, uh, you know, to get more in tune with that sort of thing, because uh, data-driven decision-making is here to stay. I agree with you. And so much so that this is where all of your soft and hard skills really need to be upskilled. If I think that's correct, <laughs> made that right. But, you know. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> upskilling yourself and learning your- Yeah, yeah. But this is, this is the reality. If you don't understand the fundamentals of even, you know, your Excel and, and anal being able to analyze and link the two sheets to translatable actions exactly what you said then mm -hmm. you know you're not going to progress very far <laughs> right and, th and that's just it you know it, it's uh like i tell that um, i teach a uh, uh, i mentor uh, an analytics class on on tuesday nights and um uh, i have a I have a, a whole lot of fun doing that and, that and that's part of what got me into the um uh the fractional chief technology officer position that i'm in um uh, which I, I didn't really talk a lot about that, but anyway, um, and, and that is showing them, look, you know, uh, you may not be a SQL programmer, okay, a, a programmer in structured query language. Sorry, I, not everybody knows what that means. I'm not talking about a SQL to a movie, S-E-Q-U-E-L, <laughs> uh, acronym S-Q-L, which stands for structured query language, and we in the programming industry call that SQL, S-Q-L. Anyway, uh, you don't have to be a SQL programmer uh, per se to uh, to be a good analyst, but you have to understand the basic principles behind it, right? If you're looking at a graph, okay, a decision maker looks at a graph and they see the trend lines going up or the trend lines going down, and they're going to make a decision to, you know, uh, shift resources or uh, take some sort of measure or action to make the, the line going this way so it goes this way or, you know, wh whichever the, the, the case might be, right? So they're looking at the graph. Well, what if the data is wrong, okay? If you didn't know and understand the data behind that pretty graph, you're up a creek without a paddle and, and your butt's going to get kicked out, you know, <laughs> if, if you don't know what's happening. You have to understand what is the data that went into creating that graph, okay? So that data will be a series of rows and columns that have numbers on them and have attributes and, and so forth. Well, a query had to be run against some database somewhere to pull those numbers out. And to go a step further from looking at the numbers, you look occasionally you may need to look at the code that was used to pull those numbers. If you don't understand what's happening with that code and what exactly, it, then you won't be able to spot the issue. You go, oh, okay, somebody forgot to add this condition in their where clause, or, oh, I know the reason it looks like we got so many more numbers here is because somebody forgot to group on them, and we actually, those numbers are actually duplicates. If you had done a select distinct, or if you had added something like a group by clause or whatever, you would not have gotten those duplicates. Now, if you didn't understand all that that I just said, even if you don't program it yourself with lightning speed or whatnot, you know, if you didn't at least understand the concept, all right, then it, it, you'd be, you know, you'd be like deer in the headlights, right? You, you, you wouldn't know what to do, and you are giving wrong data, which leads to 
wrong um, graphs and the wrong graphs leads to wrong decisions and wrong decisions lead to wrong consequences. All of that could have been prevented way upstream for those that have honed the skill or at least gotten a basic understanding of the framework uh, uh, that, uh, you know, that is used to put these reports together. Mm -mm. Yeah, this is so I, I'm really passionate about this. It just, you know, I'm, sure. I'm knocking my headset off just by just thinking about it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, and maybe mm, this is the last generation of, for me, from now onwards, like everyone younger than me, learns all of this. But back in my day, and I'm not even that old, by the way, I'm only mid yeah, You don't look it. <laughs> I'm not, but, but, oh, man, I could be your father. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that, that you're not taught this unless you go and self teach. Like, there's right. many, I mean, even in universities, I, I, and I'm sure anyone on the channel can, can correct me if I'm wrong, unless you go and specifically do a detailed course, you have to go and sit on LinkedIn Learning, YouTube, uh, Excel, whatever, to do it yourself. It's not many companies that offer this type of training to support the growth of the business, but it's also a personal development skill, which I think maybe we could have, it's probably my idea to have more in-house training to be able to facilitate the business growth, even though it's personal. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh yeah, absolutely. The more, um, you know, not, not everybody is going to be motivated to do it themselves, you know, and I, and I, and I think it's, uh, it, it, it's good to, it's good to push people. You don't want to push too hard. Um, I, I, I think encouragement goes a long way and, and people understanding the value, you know, um, if if I don't see the value in a in a particular activity, I'm I'm not going to push myself to do it. Okay, uh, I, I see the value either value to me personally, value to my family, value to my job, value to my status, value to my skill set, value to some goal that I have. Right. Okay. So it, if I see the value, I will make the effort. You know, uh, uh, seeing value produces effort okay and so uh folks that will will see the value to it will make the effort now part of that is facilitation by you know uh, getting back to the employer again not not ragging on employers or anything but you know um uh, a a gentle push uh in in the right in the right direction will will go further than than one might think you know uh and and people a lot of times will tend to not want to push themselves into going in that direction uh, if, if they don't have some uh, uh, some external motivation. Okay, um, the, I think uh, when I was a school teacher, I would try to set high expectations for my students. Uh, I, I would like to push them and and tell them you can achieve more than you think you can achieve, uh, and 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 help them to strive. At, at a very high you know le level of effort and i would set those expectations high and i would help them you know reach those expectations by giving them uh you know smart goals you know uh measurable and all those things um and that was even before smart was an ac acronym you know we're talking back in the 1980s and i think they didn't come up with that until 1990 something you know whatever um but but you know i i think uh i think high expectations need to be set uh, and 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 people need to be motivated to to go that route to to start exploring you know those skills like you like you talked about uh, even if it's just a basic understanding of the uh, uh, of the principles behind it and um, you know um, uh, yeah they're they're not necessarily going to get it in a uh, regular university setting unless unless I don't know unless people adopt this mentality and start doing it as a as a normal course of uh, uh, shoot, uh, when, when you're teaching math in school, uh, part of it is uh, one, one week out of the month to talk about Excel, right, and, and, and how to do these different functions. Um, I think that ought to be ubiquitous, you know. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think if, if we don't change, nothing will. If curriculum and, and culture yep. doesn't change, then we'll be in it for the long haul, and maybe even worse so, because at the moment, probably on a mass scale motivation is, 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 is at its lowest point. So these types of mm, like 
additions or value added is probably not right. you know few and far between many people's minds at the moment so yeah i guess maybe um i would really ask like to ask you how could people or our audience or are your workshops open to the public or how does someone be mentored or even join your keynote speaker uh, talks that you have well the uh i suppose the, the best way would be you know if you if you're on my linkedin profile i've got it uh <laughs> i'll um not to give you a shameless plug or anything but uh yeah, uh, visit my LinkedIn profile. I post these things. There's also uh, I have a sessionize page. Um, Amazing. At uh, yeah, awesome. sessionize. Uh, the website is it's sessionize.com forward slash Joe dash Perez, and uh, there is where I've got uh, a, a listing of uh, of all the events where uh, where I'm speaking. There's a link. I, I usually put up a, a, a as soon as I get it. <laughs> You know, I've already got like, uh, oh, good heavens, uh, uh, 11 or 12 bookings for, for 2021 already, and they're not all out there yet. Uh, but as soon as I get links and stuff, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll put them out there uh, for um, um, for people to see, you know, really excited. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where in the world this is all coming from, Trish. I mean, it's not like I'm a famous person. You're like, I don't know, Trisha Chapman, right? Everybody knows who Trisha is. Nobody knows who I am. So somehow, you know, I, I, I try to keep the, the topics relevant. I, uh, you know, I want to present them with passion. I don't want people to to sit there and experience, be subject. I, I say this often. I actually have a presentation on this topic. Uh, death by PowerPoint. OK, yeah. <laughs> you know, avoid death by PowerPoint. You know, uh, don't uh, you know, if you're a speaker, don't just drone on and on. You know, I want to break that mold and and give people something that uh, uh, that they can take back with them uh, to their job and and be better at whatever it is that that, that they're doing, uh, and, and keep it relevant and 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 try to engage as much as as much as possible. So, uh, anyway, the um, they're out there on the sessionize page, or they will be as I as I get uh, 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 more and more you know, uh, uh, when they publish their website anyway, just a lot of these haven't put their website together yet because, well, they don't know if it's going to be virtual or in person, Yeah. you know, uh, depending upon how quickly the vaccine, uh, vaccines or whatever, how quickly they're distributed, how quickly people respond, how effective it is and, uh, you know, stemming the tide so that these things can, uh, these in-person events, can be done safely because I'm I'm ready to go. I, I really I really want to get back to being able to engage with with people uh, personally. And uh, um, I mean, it helps that I'm a bit of a ham. I'll admit that. I, I can't believe I said that on the air. Um, but <laughs> but hey, you know what you you said what you see well what you see is what you get here as well. You know I'm uh, uh, you know uh, I'm going to give it I'm I'm going to go all out. You know I, I accelerator pushed all the way to the end, you know, and, you know, when you, when you hear me, you're, uh, I, I'm going to bring some energy into the room and, um, you know, I, I want to ignite in your head and in your heart, the same passion that I have for whatever topic that, um, uh, that I'm speaking about. Amazing. Joe, thank you so much. I know you're actually got a chat with Senegal coming up. So thank you very much. In closing, what is Absolutely. It, last, uh, some last advice or words that you would like to leave us with? Okay. Um, I would say focus on the positive. All right. Uh, there, there's plenty of negative in this world. There's plenty of, man, there, there's a lot of things that we've been going through lately with this stupid virus. Okay. Um, rather than dwelling on uh, whatever negative has come in, into your life, whatever uh, heartache you've had to go through, whatever uh, hardship, you know, be, be grateful for what you have and be grateful that things could be worse, that someone else is probably worse off. If you look hard enough, you'll find somebody who's a little bit worse off. Uh, if I keep looking down, I'm gonna get a crick in my neck. You know, Look up every once in a while, look, look up, look around, look out, look at others, whatever you can to, uh, to help your fellow man. And uh, you know, be, be grateful for, uh, for the blessings that you have in your life and be grateful for uh, the people in your life, the people that, uh, that that are more important, you know, your wife, your family, your kids, if you have kids, uh, your friends, if you're if you're not married and don't have a family, your friends and other people that, uh, you know, you you by maintaining a positive outlook, 
you can bring some sunshine into somebody else's life, you know, and, and if somebody else is going through some hard time, hey, you might be the the instrument that is used to turn that person's frown into a smile. Uh, and, you know, you never know, somebody might do the same for you, pass it on, pay it forward and uh, be be real, be good and be positive. I love it, Joe. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Take care. Absolutely. You too.